Wow, you, y'all too kind, y'all too kind. Oh my gosh. Um, good afternoon, how's everyone doing? Good. Y'all good, y'all chilling, y'all Gucci out here? <laughs> y'all who? Y'all chilling? All right, that's what's up. Um, so, just to give you a backdrop as to who I am, my name is Jonathan Cabrera. Y'all probably like, yo, so you, should, you shouldn't be sitting over here with us, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, age-wise, you know, I'm, I'm not that far removed from a lot of y'all. Um, you know, I basically, straight out of undergrad, went straight into grad school, so if you're thinking about your master's degree, I highly recommend it. Um, I went to a small state university in Jersey City, New Jersey, called NJCU. I did it for four years. Got my bachelor's in criminal justice with a minor in English. I jumped around majors like three times, that's why I got that, that minor in English. Um, <laughs> it happens, but then once I kind of got my life together and figured, okay, I think this is where I want to go, I ended up going to NYU for my, my graduate program. I did my master's in public administration. Um, I'm originally from New York, though. I'm, anybody from New York over here? I know there's always one person, okay, no, it's, it's all good, I'm out here. Y'all out here too, you know what I'm saying? We all, we all in this together. Um, but I'm originally from New York. I spent the first half of my life in Queens, New York. Y'all heard of Nas, 50 Cent, Nicki, Nicki Minaj, these type of artists. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm from. Um, and basically, I transitioned over to Jersey City, New Jersey when I was about 13 years of age. Uh, once I got into Jersey City, um, you know, I mean, even in New York, was uh, a lot of it in Jersey City, I was, you know, exposed to all types of stuff, drug dealings, uh, gang violence, you know, all this stuff that happens in the quote-unquote hood, right? So it's like, from first-hand knowledge and experience, I can talk about, you know, mental illness and trauma and things of that nature that come specifically from being in a certain environment. Now, obviously, in general, as a, as a society and as people as a whole, it don't even matter like what background you come from. Everybody experiences a level of, you know, trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, even though that's true in general, that obviously gets even more specific once you start talking about certain communities and certain environments and things of that nature. Um, so that's kind of what that's kind of what I'm going to get into today. I am going to include uh, talks and conversation of the school to prison pipeline. But we're, we're going to touch on like different topics and categories and things that I need to have to do with mental illness. So going back to my experience, so right after I graduated from undergrad, basically I went straight into working at a halfway house in, in Patterson, New Jersey. Y'all heard of Fetty Wap? <laughs> Baby, won't you come my way? Right? Like, <laughs> he's from Patterson, New Jersey. So uh, he's from Patterson, Victor Cruz, from the, you know, Mr. Salsa or whatever, like he's from Patterson as, as well. Um, and I spent a year and a half working in Patterson, New Jersey. Now, Patterson has an uh, over 30% poverty rate, which of course means anytime there's low socioeconomic you know, resources and opportunities, there's the opportunity for crime to happen. You're gonna see a lot of burglaries, a lot of carjackings, a lot of you know, drug dealings, things that obviously are not necessarily gonna benefit society as a whole. Um, so I worked straight out of undergrad, 21 years of age at the time, um, and got into this case manager role. I started working with people on parole, people on probation. They was in there for all types of offenses. Sex offenders, sex offenders were like the first individuals I actually started dealing with. I'm like, thank you boss, you know, I appreciate this. Because uh, it was interesting, because like you're, you're sitting there and you're reading each person's case and it's getting very descriptive and detailed as to like what the, what the offense was, how it happened, all of this, you know, I, I, I had to do a, a very solid job in separating personal from business because it could get very, very messy. Um, so I did that for a year and a half, um, and basically just helping guys come back into the community, find employment, education, things of that nature, maybe a license and like forklift or something of that nature. So I did that for a year and a half. I was still pursuing my masters at the same time I was doing that. Right after after this at the halfway house in Patterson, New Jersey, that's when I got the call to move back to New York because uh, at the time I was still living in Jersey, I moved back to New York so I could work for the Department of Corrections. So now, basically for a year, while I'm doing my master's program, um, I'm over in the Department of Corrections, like this is like, you know, the, the, the big dogs now. I'm, I'm over here on the shoulders with like, you know, commissioners and the wardens and different types of people and stuff like that. Um, but literally when I was in, in the Department of Corrections, I was exposed to all types of stuff. Um, and one of the facilities that I had to manage, I had four facilities. Um, three of them were in the boroughs, meaning that they weren't necessarily on Rikers Island. Y'all heard of Rikers Island before, right? Yeah. Okay, so 
Rikers Island is, it's the, it's the jail that is in New York City, right? Um, if you were to fly from over here to New York, you could only fly to one or two airports. You're gonna fly to LaGuardia or you're gonna fly to JFK. LaGuardia is literally across from Rikers Island. Like literally as soon as you land, you can see Rikers Island like right across from it, okay? So Rikers is a literal island, like on some Alcatraz stuff. Like it's a literal island. Um, the environment, definitely not an environment that I recommend anybody to be in. Um, and when I worked in the three borough facilities, they were just in the regular community. You could take a train, you could take a bus over there, drive, etc. But then the other facility that I had was literally on Rikers Island, okay? Rikers is in itself is an island that has 10 facilities on it. Um, it has only one woman facility. It holds, it holds about 300 women. Every other facility is for men. All right, the majority of adult men, you know, 20, 20 years and plus. Um, there, there was a juvenile facility, but I think they took it down um, recently. Uh, but the facility I was on was called AMKC. That one was actually 40 acres, that one facility, okay? That facility was half GP. Y'all know what, what GP stands for? General population, yeah. So it was half GP, meaning like everybody was just like, quote unquote, regularly committing crime and stuff like that. And then the other half was MO. G give me a guess as to what you think MO is. And, and it's kind of in relation to, um, to the topic of like mental illness. What do you think MO stands for? It's mental in the first part. I'll give it away, it's, it's mental observation. Okay, so half the population was GP, um, which basically had everybody, you know, from all types of crimes, theft, um, jump and turn styles, not, you know, fair evasion, um, graffiti, murderers, whatever, you know, it had all types of different people. MO, the other side of the facility, was basically people that had mental illness, you know, they, they could have suffered from schizophrenia or could have had, you know, deep levels of depression and things of that nature, um, or just undiagnosed mental, you know, mental illnesses and things of that nature. But the unfortunate side of things is that um, a lot of times you're gonna find the homeless getting arrested, for example, and a lot of the homeless population in New York because New York actually has um, the right to shelter. So a lot of people actually come from other states, even from like maybe other countries, like, like, like um, other states that are countries like Puerto Rico or like Hawaii or something of that nature, all the way to New York just because of the right to shelter. But the reality is these people probably need some kind of, you know, mental health care or treatment and things of that nature. But DOC, understanding that this is the population, they just had to put a label on it saying this is mental observation. So um, kind of to show you, this is my, my proof, quote unquote, receipts <laughs> that I was going to present at South by Southwest, basically talking about um, the school to prison pipeline. The reason why I wanted to talk about that specifically there is because Oftentimes, trauma starts very early in a person's life, okay? If you grow up in an environment in which you're just surrounded by drug dealers and violence and just all this gangster activity and, and what have you, it's like the likelihood of you repeating that is pretty high, even though logically you would think, no, you should run away from that, you should get away from that kind of lifestyle. Just think about it like this. Try to imagine a color you've never seen before. If I told you that there was a color called Mars, or, or, or let's say there's, there's a color called um, blank, let, let's just say that. Can you imagine what that color looks like? Yeah, like, yo, what the, what, what's up blank? Like, blank ripple? Like, what you talking about out here, man? Like, <laughs> so it's, it's the same thing. Like, if you have a, a young person that has never seen it, they, they've never seen what it looks like to be a business person, like on the legitimate side, or they've never seen a male from their community look like some, you know, something that's not a basketball player or not a drug dealer or something of that nature, it's very difficult for you to pursue something that you've never seen before or to even be aware that that even exists. So today I wanna to talk about the criminal justice system um, and its relationship to mental illness. So before I even get to that, I wanna kinda of get like your general participation as well. I don't want you to just stare at me, you know. I, I know I got this cool little jacket, but I know y'all have a lot to offer as well. So uh, when, when you think about mental illness, what usually comes to mind? I'll raise your hands. And then, and then when you raise your hand, just give me your name real quick. Yeah. I'm Zaza. Um, I usually think about like forms of anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. and like other, other, other things that just cause you mental, like not well being. You know? Exactly. 
Yeah. And any other definitions y'all can think of? Like, what would be a, a specific example of like a mental illness? Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. Like OCD. Like uh, it's just anything that prevents you from like having your own like, uh, way of life. Yeah, pretty much. So anything that's keeping you from being a quote unquote functional, normal individual. Uh, normal by society's general standards of it, right? So this is straight off the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Um, any or broad range of medical conditions such as uh, major depression, schizophrenia, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, or panic disorder that are marked primarily by su sufficient disorganization of personality, blah, blah, pretty much everything y'all said, right? Uh, so that's, that's a general definition in regards to that. And oftentimes, people, at least until recent times, haven't, haven't realized or understood that depression is actually a form of mental illness, right? And the reality is that everybody at some point in their life experiences depression, whether it's mild depression or whether it's chronic depression. The reality is, at some point we experience these things, and so we can actually, if you want to be technical, be diagnosed with it if it was to show up at a, at a therapist's office or a doctor's office at that time that we're going through that. Now, just because we go through these things doesn't mean that we have to remain in that position but unfortunately, if we use some of the statistics from uh, the New York State Department of Health, they say more than one in five New Yorkers has symptoms of a mental disorder, okay? So literally, I could go every five person in here, you know what I'm saying, in New York City, and that person got some kind of mental health disorder. So we're just starting like on the elementary level right now. We're not even getting into the criminal justice side of things. We're just talking like, we just regular people trying to go about our lives. You know, if you're Spanish, you eat some Spanish food. You know what I'm saying? If you like to, you know, watch movies, you know, you, you do that. But at the end of the day, regardless of your regular life patterns, one in five people, right? Uh, one in 10 adults and children experience mental health challenges serious enough to affect functioning in work, family, and school life. So now, obviously, it's a little higher number, but you're still talking about every one in 10 people, the level of health challenges mentally that somebody can go through is strong enough to actually affect your work, to affect your school performance, to affect, you know, just the way you go about socializing with people. Imagine the, the overall, you know, damage that, the, that that does to the economy, and we're gonna get into that a little bit, right? Um, half of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by age 14. Okay, so you're talking about just like the general range, and all of this is coming from the New York State Department of Health website. Um, Basically, if you take the average of like youngest to eldest, you're talking about the average point where at least half of the overall community experiences some kind of mental health illness, you're talking about 14, right? But really three quarters begin by age 24. So again, you're talking about the society as a whole, you're not even getting, getting into the nooks and crannies of like the nuances of being you know, involved in the criminal justice system because that in itself brings its own level of trauma. Right? Um, what, what are some ways that you think a 14 year old could have already been traumatized? Like, what, what, could, what could happen to a 14 year old that it's like, yo, like, you, you going through this already? Like, what's going on? Like, what? Just throw out some ideas for me. What are some things you could think about? Yeah, death of a family member. Death of a family member. Yeah. Parents divorce. Parents divorcing, definitely. Abuse of parents. Abuse of parents. Bullying in school. Bullying in school. And, and, and my friend over here, Hector, he always makes me laugh. Because um, he's like, you know, you always remember the person that did you wrong, but you never remember the one that actually was good to you, right? So I, I'll be cracking up. I'm like, yo, man, like, I'm, I'm, I'm done with you right now. But um, it's, it's, it's true. Like, for example, bullying, right? You have um, somebody could have bullied you like 10 years ago when you was like five years old, maybe, or, you know, and you, you always remember that. It could have been 20 years ago. You always remember that one bully when you was like a little kid. Somebody could have helped you out with your homework last month and you forgot about that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it'd it be like that sometimes. Um, and of course, the trauma can just continue to happen by the time you get to age 24 because when we talk about crime in general, and I always mess around with my students like this, uh, it's, it's a young man's sport, right? If we're talking about crime, a, a great percentage of people that are incarcerated, they're like 20 to 30. You're gonna find some people in their 40s. Yeah, of course you have your, your outliers in like the 60s, 70s, but the majority you're talking about within like, you know, juveniles to like maybe mid 30s or what happened. Because it's pretty difficult for a 70 year old man to come up to you and be like, 
<laughs> Hold them up, I'm here. I'm, I'm here to rob you, you know what I'm saying? By that time, you probably do work on old, old, old guy right here, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's a pretty unlikely scenario. Um, <laughs> unless you're like Triple H's cousin or something like that. But other than that, it's like, you know, that it's, it's not very likely to happen. But because crime happens a lot, especially once you're transitioning into the juvenile years, the teenage years, um, there's a lot of pent-up aggression. There's a lot of, you know, especially for young men, there's a lot of testosterone, especially now, you know, a lot of our youngins, like, they're like six, four, six, you know, huge. And I'm like, bro, like, you 16 for real? Like, really? Like, what's happening, you know? So it, it creates opportunities for um, victim, you know, victim-induced crimes and things of that nature. Um, and mental disorders that appear early on, when left untreated or associated with disability, school failure, teenage childbearing, um, unstable employment, marital instability, death by suicide, and violence. So literally everything you would not want to happen to a person, you automatically become susceptible to this just by the fact that you may have some kind of mental health disorder early on in life, okay? And when left undiagnosed, unfortunately it just continues to become a trickle down effect. Now, this is the financial burden that we end up carrying because of this. Nearly $200 billion is lost each year nationwide uh, in reduced earnings due to mental health problems. So whether it be because of crime, you know, because somebody robbed somebody because maybe they're going through some trauma or they're going through some personal situations, whether it be I can't hold the job because I don't like how my manager talks to me and it reminds me too much of like my pops or something like that. It's like all of this, like all these traumas that, that everybody's sustaining, we don't even realize it because it's not necessarily tangible. It's not something you could write on the table, on, on, a, on a paper, right? Um, these are invisible circumstances, but they're very real. Um, all of this combined, and obviously there's a whole lot of other examples we can run through, but um, these specific scenarios cost, you know, our country billions in dollars. Um, of course, there's, di there's different forms of trauma. You can get trauma from different things. You can get trauma from being discriminated against because of your race. Uh, you could get trauma because you don't have money to even survive, right? Um, if your stomach is touching your back, I'm, I mean, that's kind of painful, you know what I'm saying? Um, educational trauma, so that's kind of why I get into the school to prison pipeline. This familial relational trauma, we talked about it a little bit, right? Like getting abused by parents or maybe family, friends, something of that nature. Even relationships, you know? It, it doesn't even have to be a physical abuse. It could be like, you know, maybe just being, you know, spoken down to continuously, continuously, and you stick around in that relationship for, for a long time. Like, you develop trauma from that. Um, obviously getting assaulted, you being the assaulter, you also develop trauma. Right, because a lot of people think, oh, this person shot somebody, oh, now that person's dead. Ah, uh -uh. this person over here still has to deal with that, I, that thought, like, yo, I just killed somebody, or I just robbed somebody, or, you know. And so a lot of that, we might think that it just goes over the, the perpetrator's head, but in reality, it still resonates because having, having worked in Rikers Island, and even now still currently working with people who, you know, who have done time and things of that nature, um, you'll find that oftentimes they do, you know, find that, like they do find their, their humanity later on. You know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily something that it's like, okay, I, I separated myself 20 years back and I never joined back into my humanity. It's kind of difficult for you to do that unless you're like a very sociopathic individual. Um, and of course, criminal justice-based trauma. Trauma that just by being in contact with the criminal justice system, you automatically have to deal with, okay? Forms of racial discrimination. You have African Americans experiencing trauma significantly more, uh, well, after, yeah, they experience significantly more instances of discrimination than either Asian or Hispanic Americans. All right, non Hispanic whites um, experience the least discrimination, so you basically have 11% for whites versus 81% for blacks in regards to just like racial discrimination and things of that nature. Um, the African Americans who have experienced the most racism were significantly more likely to experience symptoms of PTSD as well. So again, I'm just kind of building you up a little bit because I don't want to jump straight into the criminal justice trauma because you have to realize you're not just talking about only the criminal justice trauma. You're talking about everything that happened even before that. What led up to that, right? If we're, if we're going to be criminal justice majors, if we want to get into law, if we want to be um, law enforcement, 
uh, work in the jails, work in prison, whatever it is you're trying to do, yeah, you have to understand the law enforcement side of things or, you know, the criminal justice side of things, but you have to understand the criminal mind, right? I'm, I'm saying criminal loosely, but um, you have to understand both sides of the perspective. Um, and we're talking about some of the socioeconomic trauma. If, if you're seeing that your family is struggling, for example, like there's a lot of, unfortunately, trap houses and y'all familiar with what trap homes is, is it, and all that, right? So basically, like you have um, a home that's abandoned, and you know that could be somebody's, you know, that could be my own or my mother or somebody close to my family, you know, leaving kids behind, take, taking the money used for like my food and stuff like that, and buying crack or buying whatever drugs, and then I'm over here, you know, locked in this house. Like that trauma will cause a young person, you know, to go straight to the streets for some kind of support, some kind of assistance. And if that means that I have to sell drugs, because at the end of the day, if me being moral is not gonna keep me alive, it don't make sense for me to be moral. And that's the unfortunate side of things, but it's the reality, and it's the reality that we have to understand. So you, you may resort to selling drugs, right? Uh, you may resort to just robbing people, or maybe even robbing a drug dealer, right? There's, there's so many different ways and plays that can occur in this situation. And one thing about drug dealing is, right, because it's not, it's not usually the person that's high on drugs that does the killing. Because you high, like, you just, you know what I'm saying, like, you, you gone. <laughs> you're not even, you're not even in, the, in this universe right now, okay? It's usually some of the other people, like the drug dealers, you know, it, it's like Biggie said in the Ten Crack Commandments, don't get high off your own product, right? Um, but the drug dealer is basically going to feel some type of way, oh, you're fringing on my territory, you know, you're not even part of my crew, this and that, and then that's kind of how you get beef started and going about and things of that nature. Um, and then that could obviously lead to murder and homicide rates going up and things of that nature. Um, and then you got scamming. So scamming's become, you know, a lot easier now with the age of technology and, you know, this, like, I don't know if y'all see these videos on YouTube and Facebook, but literally, like, people could just walk up to you like, Bing, you know what I'm saying, like, put, put like a scanner right behind your pocket and then they, they got your information. You know, like in New York, that's a that's that's a real real thing in New York because everything is just like walking distance, you know. So it's like it's easier for somebody to just walk up to you in the subway than you don't even realize they, they pretty much just stole your whole identity. Um, this also adds to a lot more of the trauma, right? So this is kind of getting into the criminal justice system in itself. This is um basically off of a, a BuzzFeed article that kind of broke down how often people get away with murder, um, or even attempted murder, right? So, if you're talking about non-firearm victims, so basically victims of maybe just like a regular assault that didn't include a firearm or something of that nature. Um, you're talking about the black lines right here, they're basically, they basically have a higher rate of closure, meaning that the cases get closed more often than they don't, okay? so. Even in regards to like the um, the disparity between minority between black, Hispanic, and then white, you have a 72% closure rate for black and Hispanic population, and then you have an 80% closure rate for the white community, right? So it kind of shows the racial dynamic there as well, where it's like law enforcement they're generally going to put more of an emphasis on closing cases that involve white victims in general. Um, of course, this is also true. For firearm victims, okay, so a victim that got shot, you know, they could have been killed or maybe just flesh wound or something of that nature. Um, but obviously we can see that in both cases, for the black and Hispanic community, the numbers drop. It drops, you know, less significantly when it's a non-firearm related case, but when it's a firearm related case, it's, you pretty much just dropped a, a rock off an edge, kind of, in that sense. Um, and. For example, in cities like Chicago, do y'all know what they call Chicago? Like the nickname they gave it? Chirac, right? Uh, do, do you know why they call it Chirac? Uh, Iraq's not really the best place, and so I figured that's why. There's, 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 there's a correlation there. So basically, the statistics show that um, on a yearly basis, or at least you know by the time that the phrase was coined, um, there were more people dying in Chicago from gun violence, right? Pre predominantly in Southside Chicago, that's, that's basically where 
you know, all the gangs and all that type of activities that um, there were more people dying from homicide in Chicago through, you know, shootings and stuff like that than U.S. soldiers died going to Iran, uh, to, to Iraq, you know, in the 2000s. So just to show kind of the correlation, it's like you're comparing what the media portrays as, you know, third world country war zone to now we got an actual literal war zone here in the United States in a, in a pretty big city or in a main city like Chicago, right? Um, and this is just an example. Are y'all familiar with the Freddie Gray case? Okay, so, you know, there's been different instances of um, police brutality or just, you know, black lives that have died at the hands of, of police. Um, we could talk about Eric Garner, we could talk about Mike Brown, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice. Freddie Gray was a specific example. This was in Baltimore. Um, I don't know if anybody watches baseball here, but the Baltimore Orioles, I forgot who they played. They, right after there was the, the Baltimore riots as a result of Freddie Gray's death, like literally there was nobody in the stadium. Like the city said nobody can go to the baseball game. So you had the Baltimore Orioles playing a real baseball game. Like this game counted towards the season. <laughs> like with an empty stadium. And like literally you just hear everybody in the dugout, like, yeah, 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 you know what I'm saying? I'm like, bro, there ain't nobody cheering for you. Like, what's up? You know? But basically, Freddie Gray, he was um 25, I believe, at the time when he was basically put in custody. He got put into a police vehicle. Um, but basically the way he got put in there pretty much fractured his back. Um, it fractured his spinal column, and then he he ended up dying from those injuries. When when that had happened. Basically, the statistics here in regards to the closure rates for, uh, for Baltimore, you have fatal shootings, the closure rates were at here, you know, pretty steady, 51%, then it dropped to 25% as soon as Freddie Gray's death happened. For non-fatal shootings, it was at 38%, and then it dropped to 23%. Um, before we even get to this, why do you think fatal shootings is higher than non-fatal shootings? Pretty much. And Baltimore, you know, like like the gritty areas, like they're gritty. Um, and so it's like if the person didn't die, pretty much what's the point of even pursuing this case? You know, like let them kill themselves pretty much. Let them let them depopulate themselves. That's that's the mentality that a lot of unfortunately individuals will take behind law enforcement. And it shouldn't be like that, but it's the reality. And so you also you, you have to look at it from a political standpoint, too. Like, would people feel more comfortable, you know, knowing that the homicide rate is lower or that the assault rate is lower? You know, so it makes more sense from that perspective as well. Uh, but basi basically, when Freddie Gray's death happened, the reason why both of these shot down exponentially was because the riots, right? So you only have so many police officers on the force. They basically got overworked. Um, people who had cases in homicide or, you know, in the non-fatal shootings or whatever, they basically got moved over to, um, to working the riots and stuff like that. And so for, for pretty much about a year, if anything, even continuing after that, um, the numbers in regards to closure rates for fatal shootings and non-fatal shootings dropped down significantly. So that means that a lot of cases, at least, at least minimum in the time frame of a year, actually went unsolved, unfortunately, right? And I'm kind of giving y'all this because when you have crime continually happening, uh, happening and the police don't have the capacity to even sustain that effort to like, because 50% closure rate, that's, that's still not even good. Like, you're talking about it's a coin flip for me to solve a murder, you know what I'm saying? Um, if, if it's already a questionable thing in, in regards to like my safety, my personal safety as a civilian, knowing that these are, are the statistics, imagine right here, and once that drop specifically happens, it's like whatever trauma or fear I may have had of like becoming the next victim or becoming the next person that, that gets shot, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally, because there's a lot of crossfires, right? There's a lot of people that end up dying in the midst of a drive-by or in the midst of any shooting in general that were not ever intended to be victims. Um, my fear automatically just goes up even more because a lot of cases are going unresolved. In regards to the school to prison pipeline, um, basically this is this, this is a big issue in itself because you're basically talking about getting children already acclimated to the prison system, 
right? I, I don't know if anybody listens to The Breakfast Club or, you know, what have you, but they was talking about a six-year-old girl. This was earlier this month. Um, this was out of Florida, okay? She actually got arrested at her charter school, and literally she got put in the police vehicle and she got a mugshot taken of her, six years old. And so, I mean, I don't know how threatening she was, uh, but basically they felt the need to literally put cuffs on her. You know, they, granted they used the rubber cuffs, but you know, they put cuffs on her. They put her in the vehicle, took a mugs out of her, and they did this in the school as well. So now forever, right, as long as she has this memory, she's always gonna look at school with, with this bad experience and this bad lens, right? Um, and not just her, unfortunately, this is a, a very common thing. And we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, uh, just the whole US demographic in general. If you're talking about white, black, and Hispanic, you could combine the black and Hispanic populations together and it still doesn't equal the white population. There's still a lot more from the white community that you know populate this country than any other race. So that's basically why the, the public school enrollment rate is very, is much dramatically higher for, um, for the white community, but not as much for the black community. But if we're talking about out of the white or black community, which one gets more multiple suspensions than the other, the black community actually goes higher than the white community. Even though the public, the public school enrollment is not even close, okay? Um, black students represent 31% of school-related arrests. Black students are suspended and expelled three times more than white students. And students suspended or expelled for discretionary violations are nearly three times more likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system just the following year. So you're not even talking about the years after that, you're only, you're only talking about just one year later, right? So right off the bat, that school to prison pipeline looks a lot more real. And to kind of put it into a little more perspective for you, so I kind of gave you a little background as to like where I come from, you know, the environment that I grew up in, et cetera, et cetera. Rikers Island is by no means, you know, Six Flags or, <laughs> you know, no, no amusement park you'd ever want to go to, but I can, I can tell you from personal experience, like I personally never got incarcerated or locked up or arrested, never got caught doing nothing, I never, you know, I never touched the criminal justice system, fortunately, right? But for whatever reason, when I first stepped into Rikers Island, okay, I'm in the biggest facility on the island, it's 40 acres. Like the hallways, you know, it's dim lighting, it's like paint is hanging off the ceiling. You know, the, the island in, in itself, it's just, there's a terrible smell that comes off of it. Um, but I'm walking through the island, and this is literally in my first day, and I'm thinking like, man, like, I've never been here before, but it feels like I've been here before. You know, and I'm like really thinking about this, I'm like, why, why does it feel like that? And so, it took me some time to think about it, it, probably about a week, and then I come back, revisit this idea, and I'm like, okay, I think I understand why I feel this way. High school. You know, like going through the metal detectors, getting patted down, getting wanded, the dim lighting in the hallways. Even, even the vibes of like, the people who I, who I would call my friends and stuff like that, like people who were like, on the basketball, baseball team, whatever, like, a lot of those people, they, like, the personalities were very similar from like the guys I met behind the wall to like a lot of the friends that I had in the community. And so I said, wow, like, with me without even realizing, I was being institutionalized all these years. And never once would, would I ever think about that if I had not worked in Rikers Island. I would have never ever thought about that. I would have never realized that that was a reality of mine until I worked in Rikers Island. It took for me to go into like one of the most notorious jails for me to realize this, okay? Um, and so this school to prison pipeline is definitely a beast because they say that the building blocks, or the, you know, the building blocks of a person is the first five years of their life. Whatever they learned in the first five years, those are the things they generally keep for the rest of their life, okay? And if you grew up around poverty, if you grew up around violence and drug dealers and things of that nature, walking down the street and you see needles or you see you know, shells of guns and you know, of bullets and stuff like that. It's like, all of that, all of that is trauma. Um, and there were actually recent studies that actually showed that inner city youth from, um, from a specific county in Atlanta, 
they actually experience PTSD at twice the rate that war veterans that went to Iran and Afghanistan experience. And who, who could tell me what's the main difference between a war veteran and one of these children growing up in this, in this specific community? said like the children st still stay there because you're a child it's still going to affect you for the rest of your life um a war veteran they get the opportunity to leave that country you know at some point if they make it through their you know through their stay they end up leaving going back into the community um and they can at least have the chance to resume life normal and you might even get the benefits assuming that the veteran affairs you know they handle your stuff properly assuming right um Assume that, that you get your GI Bill, all that you could go back, you could go to school, you could, you know, you could do all that. But if you're if you're living in the hood, if you're living in this environment, the only thing keeping you there is your socioeconomic situation. You you can't like you ain't got the funds to get up out of there. Like the only other option maybe go to a shelter, you know? And and I, I've heard this directly from people that I've worked with. Um there's people that they'd rather go back to jail than to stay in a shelter. Because at least when you go to jail, like you have a cell to yourself in a lot of cases. You have the three meals, you have you know, the protection of a correction officer, you know, assuming that the correction officer is, is a stand up individual, right? Like they're not doing corruption and stuff like that. But a shelter, you pretty much have a lot of the same population, like in regards to people that went to jail, a lot of people that end up in shelters just came from jail. So it's like, it will be the same difference as being in jail in, in a lot of situations or um, and we're talking about just the general mental health status of prisoners uh, and jail inmates. So more jail inmates, 26%, than prisoners, 14%, met the threshold for serious psychological distress in the past 30 days. Um, amongst those who have been told they had a mental disorder, the largest percentage of prisoners, 24, and jail inmates, 31, reported they had a major depressive disorder. Now, I'm not, I ain't gonna lie to you, you know, because this is from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. I personally am not buying into all this specifically um, because I know from firsthand experience when you spend even just a day in jail, like you're gonna develop some kind of trauma. You're gonna develop some kind of, you know, anxiety, angst, something because jail, and, and I can't even talk about it on a prison level because that's just another situation. Rikers Island is, is a jail, even though the reputation it has kind of sounds like a prison, it's, it's um, and, and let me know when, when it's time for, uh, when I'm getting closer to the time for. You're right. Oh. <laughs> All right, got you. Um, but if you're talking about like Rikers Island, it has the reputation of almost like if it was a prison, but it's really a jail. It's a holding facility. The average person there on Rikers Island for eight to 12 months awaiting trial. So they don't even know if they're innocent or guilty yet. But you're holding somebody on Rikers Island that Basically, the tendency of a lot of the individuals is, let me join a gang, let me, you know, cut somebody, you know, give them a buck fifty. That's that's the term you would refer to, like if you give somebody, you know what I'm saying, a slice on the face. Um, like a lot of the, a lot of these activities create trauma, even if it didn't happen to you. Just knowing that happened to the guy next to you, that's trauma right there. You know, knowing that somebody got beat up because, you know, they looked at you wrong, or maybe you moved somebody's bottle of water. Or, or what, whatever, you know. Um, people all the time get into fights over phone calls. Like, when I was in Rikers, guys, they, so the phone is right here. Guys would actually like cover the phone and then they mark their numbers because they have a pin in order to access the phone. Because the thing is, if I don't cover, if I don't cover my, my pin code, the guy right behind me was just like posted up leaning and he's looking at me or whatnot, like he could just pick up my numbers and then make calls using my number. So there's all types of shicey and greasy stuff that happens in jail. That in itself is trauma because it's like, dang, I gotta be worried that you won't take <laughs> my commissary, my, my money off my phone, off my books, you know, it's like, 
Like, how can you even survive? Because you gotta continue to put money in your phone, you know what I'm saying, so that you can even make calls to your lawyers, to your family members, what have you. And it's, it, it's like, if somebody took that, then it's like your livelihood is, like whatever you can still hold on to on the outside, it's automatically going downhill. You know, so there's all types of levels of trauma. So I would say like these statistics, you know, because they're also from um, 2011, 2012. These are the recent statistics that um, BJS was able to provide, but um, it is still something to kind of work off of and at least have a general sense. More prisoners, 14%, and jail inmates, 26%, met the threshold for SPD in the past 30 days than, um, than the standard general population, which was 5%. So basically right there, they're showing you that 14% and 26%, so jail inmates experience more trauma than uh, prison inmates, okay, on a general level, on a general basis. Um, but both of them individually, you're gonna experience more trauma than the general population anyways. You, you guys following? So, overall speaking, why do you think a prisoner is not gonna experience as much trauma like somebody in prison won't experience as much trauma as somebody who's who's in jail. So just to clarify, prison is not, they haven't been officially convicted yet. Is that the difference between prison and jail? So, and, and thank you for, for asking the question because I want to make the clarification too, right? So you have jail, which usually that's one year or less. Usually that's like misdemeanors, um, you know, shoplifting maybe a bag of chips if they put you in jail for that. Um, fair evasion, maybe potentially hitting somebody, uh, depending how the seriousness of it, but usually it's all offenses that are a year or less. Um, but jail is also a holding facility, so you could literally just be let go like the next day or you know a week from now and get you, you don't get charged with anything. Um, where prison is basically for all felony offenses. So once you have an offense that's a year and over, that basically equates to you going to prison as opposed to being in jail. You're, you're gonna be in jail before prison anyways. Like if you're going to prison, you have to go to jail first because they're holding you and then that's kind of that time that you're going through trial and, and your court hearings and things of that nature. But then once you get convicted, if it's a felony, you get sent up to prison or down, whatever the geographics is and all that. That, that makes sense? So, um, so prison basically is, is a year and over. So you're talking about people who have, who have as little as one year, right? all the way to 25 life. So you're gonna be spending time with some lifers, potentially. All right, where jail is one year or you know, or less, basically like more petty kind of offenses. Why, why do you think the trauma is less for prisoners than people in jail? Yeah. I mean, if I was in a prison, I'd create some sort of a rhythm of stability. Maybe I'd make friends with some guys or, you know, I feel like I'm living in that place where whether I'm gonna get convicted or falsely convicted or you know, whatever it may be, it's just the shock is more present when you're in jail as opposed to the prison where I already know what's gonna happen to me. Right, and, and, and that pretty much got it right on the head because again, if you're a prisoner, like, because you have people, they, they, they already did two, three stints, right? Like, they already been there like for different bids and different offenses. So it's like that person you will call a career offender, right? They literally made a career just being a, a criminal. Um, but then you also got individuals, it's like, they just embrace it. It's like, if I know I'm gonna be here for five years, what's the point of me being anxious for every single day of my life? Like, I'm here for five years. I'm here for 25 years. However long I'm here for, it's like, there's no point in being anxious because my anxiety is not gonna make the time go any faster, you know? So it's like the anxiety does drop down and it does make sense because of the reasons you stated where somebody in jail, they may be there wrongfully. Wrongful convictions happen all the time. Like there was um there was a case last year and I believe it was in Texas with um Rodney Reed. Y'all familiar with that case? He he was on Dr. Phil and everything. Like basically he was um he was about to be executed. He was on death row since like the nineties and basically they found it that you know there was no DNA evidence to match that he was, you know, the killer. But wrongful convictions happen all the time. So, you know, you could be the person that's being wrongfully convicted. You could also be an individual that you never stepped a day in jail one day in your life, and now you're here with like a whole bunch of veterans. Just think of it like your first day of school in kindergarten, except you're in jail. 
It's like that. So the shock, of course, is going to be a lot higher. But either way, both of those, anxiety is still a lot higher than the general population. We go through trauma, we go through anxiety and stress out here, but it's like, it's not even close to what people go behind the wall. And then prescription medication was the most common uh, treatment site for prisoners and jail inmates who met the threshold for SPD in the past 30 days. So they do provide med uh, medicine and medications and things of that nature. When I was in Rikers, there was um, officers pushing around carts and things of that nature. But it's like, it kind of doesn't, matter to a degree because it's like you're providing them that medication, they get used to that medication while they're locked up, but then when they go back to the community, it's like, what happens to the medication? You know, they, they might be hit off with a couple, but then it's like when they run out and then they gotta go to the other side of town, like two buses and a train or whatever to, to try and get it, they're more, they're more than likely gonna reoffend before they even get that prescription drugs again. And that's an unfortunate side of the story because again, it goes back to the socioeconomics and just the, um, the overall exposure to things. Um, I'm gonna skip over these things. Basically, if we look at some of the statistics um, in regards to just overall incarceration, one in nine men are gonna see incarceration at some point in their life. This is based off the sentencing project. Um, one in every 17 white men will see incarceration at some point in their life. One in every three black men, and one in every six Latino. For women, the number drops a lot more. You, it's it's, it's a, a lot more spread out number because usually crime, especially violent crimes that, you know, men have more aggression, testosterone, generally speaking, so it's like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta be macho, I gotta prove whatever, right? Um, or maybe women are better with communicative skills or, you know, so I would like to think, right? Really? I, I, that's what I'm saying, I would like to think. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's, of course, there's always instances, but um, the reality is that the system, for whatever reasons, does tackle men more than, than anything. Um, and of course, predominantly black and Latino men. If you go down the line, in regards to just the racial dynamic of women, you have one in every 111 women are incarcerated. One in every 18 black women will see prison or jail at some point, And one in every 45 Latino women, right? So now, what stood out to me was because Obviously, with the criminal justice system, it, one thing that has to be acknowledged is that it is a very heavily race-based system. Um, when I was in Rikers Island, over 80% of the population was black or Hispanic. Um, and New York City is not only just black and Hispanic. So it's like, the statistics don't even match or make sense. Um, but basically, the statistic that stood out to me was that one in every 18 black women will see incarceration, but that's only one number less than one in every 17 white men. <laughs> and so it kind of just shows like the racial dynamics at the end of the day because, um, especially when you talk about like the war on drugs, like the crack epidemic and things of that nature, like in the 80s, they say war on drugs, but as, as it was already leaked years ago through um, President Nixon's and Ronald Reagan's advisors, they, they stated blatantly that it wasn't necessarily a war on drugs, it was a war on black people. And that's, you know, it's, it's a very sad thing to, you know, have to come to acknowledgement of that that came from the top of government, but it was the reality at the end of the day. And then even in regards to solitary confinement, right? So all of this obviously creates trauma. If you're black and Hispanic, you're out here. You're, you're like, man, I don't even know if I'm committing a crime right now. Like, you know, how visually, how alert do I have to be to not even end up in the system? Once you're even in the system, the United Nations actually came out and said that if you spend a week in solitaire, that's actually the equivalent of third world torture, right? So you could waterboard somebody, and you could put somebody in solitaire, and you're both gonna you're gonna categorize both as being torture, based off of what the United Nations stated. And so, if you're talking about the solitaire population, even though the white community makes up 37 percent of um, the overall prison population, and this was a sample of just under 60,000. Uh, solitaire prison prisoners, even though they make up 37% of the overall prison population, the numbers drop in regards to how often they get put into solitaire, right? But even though the black community makes up 40% of this population, they get put into solitaire more, more times than there is of that actual population, which means that you're going to have the same person going over and over into solitaire, which means 
that's more trauma, that's more torture based off what the United Nations is saying that that person's receiving. Similar to the Hispanic population, even though it's not as pronounced as, um, as the black community. And so, these are the average ranges in regards to how often somebody spends in solitary. This, is, this was um, a study from the Yale Law School. And um, basically, you got the average time somebody spends in solitary, or the, the, the most amount of time somebody spends is one to three months. So if one year is it, one year, if one month is one week is considered torture, then what does a month do to somebody? That's that's one week times four at least, right? It's like you you basically multiply that that trauma or that torture by four times if you're talking about just one month. But now now if you're talking about two or even three months, it's like like you could only hope that that person you know gains back some, some inkling of maybe who they used to be or you know some level of their humanity. And you're not even talking about the rest of the time people actually see while they're in solitary. You got three to six months being the second highest. You got, you got six months to a year, a year, a year to three years being right after that. Then you got three to six years, then you got six plus years. The fact that you can keep somebody in solitary for six plus years is like, I can't even stay in my in, in my apartment for you know in an apartment for for a whole day. It's like let's only keep somebody you know confined in like the space of a bathroom. It's like whoa, what's what's happening, right? Is the death penalty probably better? I, I don't want to find out. <laughs> um, I mean it depends on the individual. You know, like if they have belief in the afterlife or something like that, you know they might feel like hey you know. This is God's way of punishing me. I'm gonna just deal with this now and then I'll talk to him later or her or whatever. But some people might might choose to opt out. And that like that was the case with um what's his name? Aaron Hernandez, the oh, football yeah. player. Um apparently Jeffrey Epstein as well, even though that's you know, this conspiracy is <laughs> you know, I mean the, the, the correctional officer just decided to leave him alone when you know he's on suicide watch. That's another story. Uh, I think what I was trying to say is like solitary confinement was created for a reason. Yeah. Not like, people didn't let go there just because they were angels or yeah. No, of course. The the purpose of solitary, if you go back to um to Eastern State Penitentiary, for example, because the word penit uh penitentiary comes from the word penance, right? Because um Christianity reigned for many years in the early parts of America. Um the point of it was for you to reflect and talk to God. So you had a Bible that you would sit down for like however many days you was locked up for, and you would, you know, think about your stuff, commit penance, basically. Um, but basically, you know, it, it shifted and took different forms, and solitaire, obviously, is now used as a form of punishment for, you know, the worst of the worst. But now the question is, what happens when the worst of the worst, like solitaire doesn't do anything to, to them anymore? Because you got people that they could do a month of solitaire, and as soon as they come out, they slash somebody literally in that same day. So it's like the effects of solitaire. It's like <clears throat> somebody can literally be so far gone that they did a whole month in solitaire, and it's like the first thing they do is like stab somebody or slash somebody. It's because people are fighting death penalty. It's being cruel. Well, I mean, it, it depends because. You still, have, you still have um in the facilities, for example, where like there's death row and stuff like that, you're still gonna use solitaire because at the end, whatever offense they were put in there for, you know, you can still go in there for solitaire even if it was like maybe carjacking or something of, of that nature. It, solitaire is more based on like the offenses that you commit while you're already in there. Yeah, so it, it's not like you're coming from the outside and you get straight thrown into solitaire. That's, like, there may be occasions where that happens, like, um, they did that with Centoria Brown, y'all yeah, know Centoria Brown? They did that with her because she was 16 at the time, so they did it for her protection, but they actually traumatized her more because they, they was trying to create the separation between her and the adult population. But, um, generally speaking, you're not just thrown straight into solitaire as soon as you make it into the facility. You have to commit an infraction while you're behind the wall, and basically that's gonna put you into solitaire. It's basically supposed to be like their version of time out. Um, yeah, cause, cause once you commit your crime, it's like the jail bid, like the sentence that you're taking or the prison sentence, that in itself is a punishment. But there's punishment within the punishment based on like your activity and the way that you go about your, your business and stuff like that. Um, 
And of course, this is the example I used from a, um, in regards to Atlanta. Basically, um, Kerry Wrestler at Green Memorial in Inner City Public Hospital in Atlanta, he interviewed 8,000 patients. Um, he basically did a survey, and basically over two-thirds endorsed that they had been victims of a violent assault. 50% um, of the patients surveyed reported personally knowing someone that had been murdered. So that's a coin flip right there. If you're talking about out of 8,000 people that were surveyed, 50% of them knew at least one person that had been murdered. That kind of shows you know, the, how, how high the crime rate is in a specific area and like obviously the level of trauma. Because that person could have been a family member, could have been a friend, somebody they knew personally, right? Um, in another study conducted by within the, within the same hospital findings, yielded increased rates of traumatic events exposure. Um, in general, findings suggest that about 65 to 87% of participants experienced exposure to traumatic events, um, and 33 to 60% of those individuals developed PTSD. So pretty much the numbers just continue to go up higher and higher in regards to just the level of trauma because once you touch the criminal justice system, that adds another layer of trauma, right? You have to take into account corruption that happens behind the facilities. There's a lot of corruption that happens in, in the Department of Corrections. It was actually one of the top, um, in New York City, DOC was one of the top five agencies that gets investigated for corruption on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, there's a whole bunch of city agencies in New York, but DOC is like top five, okay? Um, then of course the police department they don't even get investigated by the Department of Investigations in New York because they actually have their own internal affairs, and so that basically becomes their own personal Department of Investigations, which, you know, imagine if, if, you were, if you were asked to investigate your own family and tell the police, hey, you know, these are my findings, um, you know, we didn't find anything going on over here. It's like, why would you, why would you draw a snitch on yourself? You're not gonna do that, you know? Like, even in, in um, in law enforcement, there's this quote-unquote blue code of silence, right? Which basically means like no snitching, no, you know, turning on your own, blah, blah, right? Basically, it's, it's very similar to street code in the sense of like, the, the idea of not snitching is like the, snitching is the worst possible thing you could do in the streets. Like if you a drug dealer, if you a gangster, what have you. But then obviously, the same applies also in law enforcement. Um, what I would like to do, is just end y'all off with a spoken word slash rap. Is that cool with y'all? I, I, I got some bars, you know. <laughs> I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams coming to fruition. My people come from places where we have rotten conditions. According to the bureaus, I'm supposed to be a statistic. Analytics call me criminal for my birth or existence. I'm out here with a blade, some got a Glock for resistance. I'm just trying to stay safe from shots of going ballistic. The media try to ruin us with shots of our image. They don't show us going to hard, but only shots of ballistics. We on the front page, it look like a gun range. Call a brother Thug Strange, one white snort of cocaine. College data plug made in the model ball main. We know to play sports, all state me no cage. Quick to hook a brother rubber Perry State Greens. People who are higher up just wanna stay green. Opioid an epidemic like the crack scene. They want us to stay vocal, want us to stay fiends. All these politicians just be talking, don't be walking on this political jargon, cover up many of your caucus. Never side with issues, less in need of all support, otherwise we up in court. They be running for a caucus, genocidal, then it turns suicidal, living life on survival, put their hand on the Bible. Oh, money remains their idol, office remains idle, asking for an inch now, we never get a mile. Our people be sobbing, all of this got me throbbing. Youngest began robbing, we have no Batman and Robin, they done killed all our heroes. Memory of them zero, homie this here a jungle and lion tigers is feral. School to prison pipeline, the pipe dreams, the prison got no pipe.
The bridge ain't got no bike lines, cause you will pipe fiends. Homie on this island, dudes be wild and you might see a lot of stuff in daytime reserved for the night scene. You'll see some brothers getting murdered up, homie stabbed up. You'll see some youngins getting jumped out, getting grabbed up. Get sexually assaulted and get told to man up. And if you don't man up, then you might just hang up on everything. Everything is everything. Food calls your wedding ring. Promise your life's up for grabs, reinvents in slavery. Get them while they're young, hyper suspensions and explosions. Way to keep them ignorant, education give convulsions. Every time they think about school, they think of they think of trauma. Tears were shed from the disappointment of the mama. Teacher once told them they'll never amount to nothing. That teacher up in the future faced a student now a gunman. Shots, then you find that the sun drops. Now my eyes to the moonlight, similar when the sun drops. Everybody want to tell me how with them is really going to be a different story. But this life and death thing are real, leave a other one with the glories. Fighting hard deep within myself, waging war just to overcome. If I had visions while I held my knife, how to be with a loaded gun. Little man, I just spit my truth. Apologize if I'm real blunt, couldn't handle this and just look at you. You just heard from a real one. I'm here, sitting in the back, thinking the folk in his life, walk him in contact. People I knew were just smoking their weed, sipping some hen in the cognac. Some of these people I know, unfortunately now, that have been jailed. Life is so frail, the system that fails. Claim deep life is so written in braille. <clears throat> Navigating through these rules of illusions, not only you worry about paying your bills. Weapons of Susan are used to me, music that you gotta worry about not getting killed. Circular losses for survival later. Screw all the haters. Undetonated sick inside of my chest. No time for rest. Could be innocent for banging and shooting that moment off. Gotta be the moment, momentum won't take you to go because the bullets inside of your neck. Feels like everybody's catching bodies. There's no anybody's in my body. Is there anybody in these city parties that can help me make it to my building lobby? Even to my poor, see you drive your Porsche. See your money's long, yet my life is short. I don't even know what to think. I don't even really know what to say. Could a brother even blink for the clink of a thing, make it stink with your blood? What's your body gonna lay? Could I really even pray? Feeling like Rambo, catch me the blade with some ammo. Been deserted with the rappers and the trappers, and I'm dying here thirst when I blow up like a cam. Blast. Everybody in my ear like, damn, go hand, goddamn, seek to leave my man. You've already done things in the cheap lifespan, can't mean what it did, said to me, right hand. In the air, cause you can't be, you know, I ain't never see you leave a man on the floor. I said, yeah, cause at times I say man on the floor is the man who now stands in his spit in this flow. So you ain't gotta understand it, cause this man with the plan, he to me and commanded that I be what's demanded. That's a lead via me, see the station commanded. So the God never planned it. And for me, I would speed through this light till I ran this. Sheep always sleep till the creep stick is fangs and beast so elite. Was it me? I was damaged. My digger, I figure, I'm bigger line. Figures wanna go and pull the trigger wine. Figures spilling out from the side, out till I die. Do anything just to see a spine sip up. Every day, said I'm thinking I could crash. Looking at this past, any greatest people fall. Learning how to crawl once it's curled up in the void. You should think that I was trash. Now I'm answering my call. Look. 
When they just see me rolling, everybody gonna stop and then notice that I'm living these dreams out this nightmare called life. When I wake up, I'm gonna notice this drop, this dream, it don't care, it don't fight fair. Even, even if injustice is right there, when I tweak, no, it's all from components. Opponents placed it ain't right. Either way, I keep the grind, I'm consistent. Try to take my life, I'm resistant. I'm a force, but of course, they don't like that. I ain't ask for permission. When I die, yo, I'm gonna die a legend. Nothing's gonna be a legend. Young go in the making, you know that. Go hold that, stand there with reverence.